Okay, well, hello, everybody. We're so glad that you uh, made it to our second uh, class in this series. My name is Terry Diamond, and uh, this series is brought to you um, in partnership uh, between Kenai Soil and Water Conservation District and the UAF Cooperation Extension Service, and also the AgriAbility Program that supports our Alaska growers. Um, this um, is a seven part series, but we had our first part last week, um, but it provides some wonderful content and um, our ex experts are going to be digging into how you can get the most out of your land and your growing um, to improve our local food security. Um, doesn't matter whether you're a home gardener or if you're a large scale gardener. Um, I'm sure you'll find something in here that is um, applicable to you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, Deshana York, and Deshana has been my partner in crime in all of this. Um, she's the Agribility Director for UAF Cooperative Extension, and she's in the um, Anchorage office, and she helps clients find resources that they need um, within the university system and um, uh, around a whole bunch of topics. So, um, she will introduce herself as well as the um, other speakers, and I hope you enjoy our evening. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, so welcome. Hopefully everyone's in the right place. As Terry mentioned, as our second part of the series, tonight is biochar basics and enhancing soil nutrients. As a great follow-up to our uh, session last week with Jody Anderson about soil composition and composting. If you didn't catch that series uh, or session one, we do have the recording that should have been sent to those who registered. So hopefully you check that out. If not, you can go back and check it out after tonight's session. So I have the great honor of introducing our uh, experts tonight. Uh, first up, we'll have, um, I'm gonna do a little intro for each of them. Um, and then we will uh, go ahead and get started and have our first speaker. We'll take a little break between the two different uh, speakers this evening and do some questions and then we'll do questions again at the end. So be thinking along the way if you have questions. If you want, feel free to drop those in the chat box, which is accessed by clicking the lower bar, hopefully if you're on a computer or another place on your mobile device that says chat. And you can type in the question in the chat box and we'll also, uh, I'll address those or we'll address them along the way, or we'll have an opportunity for you to ask those verbally as we go through. So our first speaker tonight will be Art Nash. He is a UAF, he's the University of Alaska Fairbanks Cooperative Extension Service Associate Professor of Energy, kind of a long title there. Art, you can give a wave out. Uh, he's interested in creative, creative ways to provide energy to Alaskan farmers and gardeners. Art originally moved to Alaska in 1991 from Northern Minnesota as a school teacher, and he joined the Cooperative Extension Service in Alaska in 2011. Uh, since then, he's worked with housing and energy construction and provided informal education around the state on a variety of topics. His research in biomass has contributed to the formation of a statewide GIS inventory of all commercial scale pellet, chip, and cord wood systems in the state, as well as case studies of Alaskan school districts who've adopted biomass for heat and power. Uh, he's assisted a variety of communities with offering recommendations on alternative energy sources, including wood and biomass usage and their economic impacts. After Art Speaks this evening gives us a general overview about biomass, we have the distinct uh, privilege really to hear from Don Iceman McNamara and Donna Ray Faulkner, who own and operate Oceanside Farms, which is a small scale sustainable agricultural farm about 5.5 miles out on East End Road in Homer. They started out uh, doing spin, which is small plot intensive farming, and now have 10 high tunnels, as well as growing spaces outdoors. When the season allows, they have a roadside vegetable stand at their farm property that attracts visitors. They are a part of the state's organic initiative and grow all their produce and certified seed potatoes without the use of any synthetic based chemicals. Don is a master composter and incorporates biochar into the farm's process for growing. And they have uh, been exploring the practice of Korean natural farming and indigenous microorganisms, which is a method they have found successful for growing naturally at their farm. So we're excited to hear about that and how they're doing those practical applications. So 
without further ado, let's get started. Uh, Professor Nash. And you're muted, just so you know. There, can everybody hear me now? Yep, and it looks great, thank you. Okay, you bet. So uh, I've been working for a number of years on biochar with uh, Ming Xu Zhang, and before that a bit with um, Julie uh, down from the uh, Anchorage office. You might have known her. She was uh, the master gardener leader and the egg hort person agent for a number of years. And um, so I've incorporated um, slides from each of them. Uh, into this show as we've kind of uh, played tag team over the last few years. Uh, so if you have specific questions, um, I may uh, get back to you and confer if there's something on a slide that's never been asked before, for instance, um, after I speak with them. So I'll advance the first slide. And I just wanted to make note that most of Alaska uh, has biomass feedstock with the exception of this area from about the Brooks Range North. There's some type of biomass in, in uh, all the other parts of the state, whether it be uh, sedge grasses possibly, or brush, or uh, forests, maybe boreal forests, or maybe, uh, excuse me, uh, boreal rainforests down in Southeast or in the interior, uh, various types of uh, birch and, um, black spruce, white spruce forests. So biomass uh, is available in order to use for biochar, but it's not just wood that can be used, although that'll be my focus tonight. So Alaska has some challenges that actually afford opportunities uh, for biomass or for biochar rather. One is there's a short season with a concentrated high solar gain. You know, we have uh, a season generally in the interior, for instance, uh, June 1, a lot of people start uh, putting things into the ground, knowing that a hard frost could come anytime after September 1, but there's an awful lot of sunlight in between, right? And so in this kind of a situation, um there you know there can be a lot of um uh, fields that are cleared or garden areas that are cleared and such like that uh for specific types of plants that can accommodate uh this type of situation and so with that kind of window that short window but with high intensity energy a lot of people want to go ahead and amend amend the soils to try to give it as much boost through that time as possible. And biochar is a vessel or a skeleton that you can uh, hang those um, types of uh, additives into your soil uh, onto. And we'll uh, note why in a minute because of its structure. Uh, also, um, there is a need, as I mentioned, um, you know, in that short amount of time uh, to have cleared land uh, often through the spring and the fall, even if snow is present, uh, there's a need to remove a lot of woody brush, uh, grasses and wood um, that may be growing back that can, or to expand your cropland that can then be used uh, for something other, you know, than uh, firewood, for instance, and that is making biochar. Also, we have, uh, oh, let me just add that if you take a look, for instance, in Delta Junction, I'm sorry, as an example, and you look at the lots that were cleared in the 1980s for the um, large push that there was to get farmers from the lower 48 to come up, if you take an aerial photo from the 80s and take an aerial photo for now, it's um, surprising uh, that in that you know, mid 80s, that maybe 35 years or so, uh, how much has grown back just into um, large forest land again. There's just a continual need to call uh, for those who've been working the land all throughout that time and, and um, a lot of wood at hand. And of course, in the interior, a lot of that wood, if it's not dealt with after it's cleared, 
in a sufficient manner, uh, it becomes a fuel for wildfires. Uh, also in Alaska, we have thin acidic, uh, that is low pH soils in general, and ones that are nutrient deficient. And so there's the need to add um, different soil amendments and to try to bring the pH up uh, in most cases and biochar can help with that. So biochar, uh, if you were just to look at it um, without a microscope, uh, just from having gone through the pyrolysis process, you might see this, you might see various chips, sawdust and such that are uh, blackened obviously, and that will crumble if pressure is applied. If not, they're a stable structure that can actually last for decades and decades. It does not biodegrade on its own. Um, you can reduce it by crushing and adding pressure, but that's one of the features of this type of structure vessel that's fairly handy. Now, if you look at it under an SEM uh, microscope, uh, you'll and here we're at 16 times magnification, you'll start to see that on one of those small pieces, you have a striation um, of different uh, fibers and you have these spaces or these pores uh, that you start to get an idea that across the landscape of this, um, there are different gaps or voids that are different sizes. And part of that is due to um, the residency time, how long in pyrolysis, which I'll describe in a moment, the uh, char is kept in. And we're talking at temperatures of roughly 200 to 500 degrees Celsius uh, without oxygen. Um, it also has to do with the specific type of feedstock that you're using. And uh, it will uh, also vary depending on if some oxygen does get let in. So you might, in other words, not have a homogeneous um, uh, homogeneous set of uh, pore sizes uh, or fiber ligaments that are left over, but you'll get areas where it's been totally blown out, so to speak, in areas where it looks like it's almost like intact wood. So if you go in even deeper, you can see that we have these little pockets and in between where the fibers were, uh, we have some long voids and then we have these pockmark holes and such. And here we're 220 times magnification. And here I'm trying to see the, I can't, whoops. Well, I can't quite see the magnification, but this is much closer. Um, here we're uh, diving in and actually looking at some of those voids. And in essence, this provides, um, you know, a kind of condo space for microbes and different bugs and also storage for various nutrients that you might add. And it might be a typical nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizer. Uh, or it might be a decaying organic matter such as compost. And we'll take a look as to uh, why storing those types of um, nutrients, so to speak, in these vessel um, corridors, if you want to call it that, is advantageous to growing plants. So a lot of this became popular approximately, oh, I would say, 30 years ago when National Geographic, uh, or excuse me, um, I'm sorry, 30 years ago when it was first discovered um, by some anthropologists and it really got a boost in the arm about a dozen years ago, a little more than a dozen years ago when National Geographic did an expose on it uh, in its uh, in its issue on food and looking at soils and the uh, part that soils play with uh, growing plants in a healthy way. And uh, this term uh, kind of was uh, popularized, even though it existed obviously before with anthropologists and such, archeologists too possibly, um, Terra Preta, Preta some uh, pronounce it, and it basically means enhanced soils that have been added to by humans in order to uh, increase its efficacy in being a support system for the structure of roots, as well as adding on 
uh, are adding uh, next to the roots a storehouse of the uh, nutrients that the uh, microbes could then transport over to the roots. And so uh, when anthropologists had dug in, this is the article that 12 years ago, National Geographic focused the most on, uh, they went into the Amazon and they uh, had found through diggings and such these pits where there was evidence that there had been uh, numerous uh, fires that had been created. Uh, but also nutrient-rich nutrient soils in that obviously this was an area that they didn't have outhouses per se, but they used for their uh, dung deposits or food wastes. And so in looking at that, um, started to see that there might be intentionally a mixing of uh, food and uh, livestock wastes as well as human wastes in areas that were burnt on purpose. And uh, so this uh, was some evidence as to why there was an agricultural system and what traditionally is poor soil um, quality in the uh, Amazon. Usually the soils are, you know, there's a lot of moisture and such, and I don't understand all the dynamics, but generally speaking, um, they're not, uh, the greatest for growing, uh, they tend to be leached out of nutrients and such, but these were very rich. These are very rich. And so in kind of looking back in the past um, at this Terra Preta, they tried to uh, unpack exactly how uh, the Amazonians uh, did this. Um, and basically uh, in a nutshell, what they found or what they believed to have happened was they would go ahead and such in a slash and burn uh, agricultural setting, they would go ahead and take large leaves, burn them on the top, um, but they would uh, dump dirt on the top of the leaves before burning them uh, so that it would choke out any oxygen. Um, because if you don't, if you allow all the oxygen available, like in a campfire, uh, with wood stoves, or excuse me, with uh, firewood, you'll notice that if you just let it burn instead of just slowly roasting, it totally consumes the wood and turns it to ash. You don't want that to happen because that'll blow out all those uh, poor walls or those corridor walls. And so by smothering, and keeping the oxygen out, they successfully created very rich soils. Now we can intentionally do this today. And one of the more popular, if you go to Ithaca Institute, which is out of Switzerland, which takes a look at practices from all over the world in making biochar, um, and that's Ithaca with a K, Ithaca Institute, you'll find that there are actually schematics on how to make the Kantiki kiln. The Kantiki kiln is basically a dish that's probably 10 to 12 gauge metal that will allow you to cold steel that will allow you in a cone truncated cone so there's no tip here on the cone will allow you to go ahead and put the uh, various biomass inside and then start the fire from the top down. And one of the advantages of starting the fire on the top down is as it burns, on top where the oxygen is available, it will drop the, it will, it will create ash here, but it will drop the fire down into zones where there is no oxygen. And you'll start to actually get a, a um, cyclone effect that you'll see of flames chasing around the edge. If you go ahead and uh, make it roughly 60 to 66 degrees, on the angles down here. For some reason, that is uh, kind of the sweet spot to allow the gases that come out of the wood, the flammable gases to burn off and in the cyclonic effect to create a negative pressure, uh, which will basically suck up the gases around the edges and burn from way down in here where it's roasting without allowing oxygen down around the edges on the inside of the vessel. Also on this vessel, it's got a tipper, but what's really nice is you'll see this water is that when you start to see ash down, you've gotten down uh, 
to about a third left and you see ash on top and then you see that the rest is pretty much a dense charcoal or biochar, then you go ahead and you load it up with cold water to stop the burn, to stop the burn. Now this is fairly heavy, so you can go ahead and tip it then to tip the water out to a rest so that you can have as uh, much of the uh, biochar uh, oxygen free as possible, or some people will put a gate valve on the bottom, fill it up without having the tipper, and then they'll just open up the gate valve and allow the water on out. So the Contiki for intentional use, at least in the Western world, whether it's in vineyards, whether uh, using trimmings from um, maybe wine, wine grope, uh, grape growing areas, or whether they're using sedge grass, or whether they're using uh, wood um, limbs or such like this, this is right now kind of uh, pun intended the hottest thing going uh, when you talk with folks who are able to um, procure the fabrication of one of these. I went ahead and got a four by 10 sheet of uh, 10 gauge uh, before uh, COVID when things were fairly cheap uh, for about $350. I took it over to Greer and they were able to make this without any welding except for one seam by putting it through a creaser and creasing this into like pie segments. And so it's a perfectly round conical shape with just a flat bottom. And I think it was roughly $1,000. So under $1,500 without the tipper, I've got a fairly large, uh, fairly large uh, contiki that's easy to use. And then I just fill it with water and just roll it on the ground when I'm done to dump the uh, material out. So, you know, I don't know what the price of steel now. It has gone up since COVID and supply chain problems, what it would run. But you can see that it's within the realm of a farmer's um, income if he were to have a couple of those made a year and maybe put them on the edge of the property uh, where you're already doing cuttings anyway of uh, or uh, beating back the brush from encroaching your growing area. Um, the other uh, style that uh, is fairly popular is less sophisticated and can be made with basically a drum that might be a 35 gallon drum and a 55 gallon drum where this will nestle inside upside down filled with material. And Don has a good illustration of this Heidi Rader walk through on a YouTube video um, on the extension website where basically you punch holes in the bottom of the outer shell, the 55 gallon drum. You turn this upside down with all the biomass inside so that just the weight pressure keeps, uh, keeps it in place. And in the meat of the donut, the empty void area, you stuff it with wood and you start it on fire. And the fire that's in this void area will go ahead and roast inside the 30 gallon drum. Um, and this is a little more than 30 here, but it'll go ahead and roast that wood and the moisture in the wood gases will slightly lift it up, believe it or not. And you will see flames around the bottom where there were holes because oxygen is coming in from the bottom and uh, it's meeting those gases and that and moisture. And so you get a lot of smoke and water vapor coming out and then you get a big puff often at the end. And then this just falls into place and you realize that you've consumed all the gases. All the wood is usually then consumed in the meat of that donut on the outside of the actual containment vessel. And you know that you pretty much are done and you don't really need to add water to this style because there's not an open uh, surface for oxygen to get in anyway. This is an example of what we call a T-LUD, top lit uh, updraft to burn. So um, the other style that's popular in the Western states with the Forest Service is to go ahead and have a trapezoidal um, size made, four of them, that then are uh, welded with an arc welder to the bottom of a plate and rebar with handles. And this is uh, pulled behind four wheelers in, in uh, 
wooded country and then as they're trimming trees up six foot or eight foot they'll drop the limbs in they'll start it on fire from the top down they'll have water containment with them they'll go ahead and stop the burn they'll roll it over and then they allow it in the conifer areas of the trees that they're trimming to kind of uh, take care of the ph by just having it broadcasted on the top of the soil now it's not going to get down to the roots of the trees, but they're not trying to enhance growth anyway. And the, it helps to, uh, I guess, mediate water, uh, water flow to the roots and such. And it helps somewhat. Most importantly, it gets rid of a lot of their waste trimmings, though. And that's kind of the main purpose for them. The other thing to think about is that I mentioned that biochar is merely a structure in order to hold either phosphorus, uh, or nitrogen fertilizers that you'll add, or compost, really by itself, uh, for the most part in gardening, it's not going to give you that boost unless you go ahead and add those uh, particular um, fertilizers and such to it. So um, biochar also is used for other things in soil amendments. It's actually added into animal feed at times uh, stormwater filtration, even some building materials and packaging, um, and in the mining industry to absorb heavy metals that are traced in different water ponds and such like that. So Ming Xu had done an experiment with the biochar that he went ahead and loaded it uh, with nutrients in one plot and put biochar without nutrients in another. And by nutrients, I mean compost. And then he did another plot, and these are one meter sections where there was uh, no biochar added at all. And we have that study if you would like to see it. In fact, in the chat box, for those who can see it, there is a, um, uh, there is a slideshow that's uh, probably about three times as many slides where we actually have charts and tables of that report of the efficacy of the biochar. And he did this in Whitehorse uh, on a small project there. So this is just to say that they're in Alaska uh, with Ainry, especially uh, Ming Shu's work. There have been quantifiable studies to show with various types of um, uh, plants, uh, the efficacy of biochar by doing these types of plot studies. Now, I don't want to take up too much of what Don would dig into on the practical uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, considerations when you're actually making, mixing, and applying it. But I did want to cover just some of the context of why biochar has come to the surface uh, in order to um, assist farmers as well as others in the last several years, and just a little bit about the physical properties. Um, and I think, uh, have I come up right against 25 minutes, Deshanna, pretty much? Yeah, you're doing pretty good. And we okay, have a couple and, little comments and questions, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so there's, right now I have up there our contact information if you'd like to contact Ming Shu or myself in asking about uh, particularly any aspects that you see on this slideshow or the slideshow that's in the chat. And the one in the chat actually gets more into the creation in that up on the farm uh, in Matsu, we went ahead and had used some equipment up there to uh, control conditions in making the char. Uh, and so if you have any questions, those are almost all pictures, no words. You're more than welcome to contact either of us. And I'll take any questions at this time that anyone might have. Um, thanks, Art. Um, kind of a question, comment. Uh, someone here was saying they're a prospector and they've seen lines of biochar from eons ago. And usually the rock surrounding it is heavily oxidized. They're wondering as a side benefit if it allows for the breakdown of minerals into a more usable form for plants. And so you might be able to address that, or we might address that in the next little segment here. Did you have any comments on that? Yeah, I'm not sure on the oxidization. Uh, that's the, and the, it sounded like it was found within the context of mining. Is that right? Yeah. yeah the, well, the individual said they were a prospector. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. Um, I don't know about breaking down. Um, typically, what happens is the biochar is a vessel 
that will hold in those uh, corridors, the nutrients that are already breaking down compost and such. And when you're mixing it in the dirt, you're, you're um, also kind of storing it away, right? The compost, because now it's going to uh, be covered over with dirt itself. And what often happens is the microbes will take those minerals and they will port them over they will walk them over to the roots and allow the roots to absorb them. Now that's a really, really simple layman's version of the whole cation exchange process and yada, yada. I mean, Chu can uh, fill you in uh, at a different time as far as uh, the actual elements uh, that are being used. And then the absorption into the roots of those nutrients, uh, whether you would call that breaking down or not, um, I'm not sure. I'm the energy guy, so I focus mostly on the energy side of things. Uh, that is the conditions to make sure that you don't have combustion, that you have uh, a lack of oxygen and uh, such as that. So um, I believe that we're talking more of just a transport than an actual housing for the breaking down of the actual elements. Uh, but okay. uh, I can check on that with Ming Shu and you can get uh, take my email. And when I verify with that with them, I can get back to you. Well, thanks, Art. Yeah, we'll probably get into that a little bit more here too, a little bit in the next segment. Um, is the black charcoal left unburned in a bonfire or wood stove biochar? Is the black charcoal left unburned in a bonfire or wood stove biochar? Uh, so usually when there's oxygen available, you get complete combustion, you get white ash. And where sometimes, especially in the corners of stoves, uh, you might have uh, blackened areas because no oxygen got there um, without knowing the specific uh, the specific stove and everything like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, my assumption is, is that probably is uh, biochar. Now, the problem with a vessel that's square, like the bottom of a stove, um, is that, you know, you've, and, you know, you see uh, people on YouTube making vessels to make biochar in different ways. You might have a mix of ash and you might also, within the biochar, have a variation of the sizes of, uh, of the uh, pores because oxygen might have um, touched one part but not even got close to another part. You might even find uh, parts of woody ligament still that haven't even been charred, right? So um, the question often is, can I take the stuff that's in my stove, empty it out, go ahead and mix it in the dirt, and will that be biochar? Um, I mean, that's a common question. And the answer is, you'll probably have a mix of ash that if nothing else is a base, B-A-S-E, uh, is going to bring up the pH of your soil, which is helpful, but it won't do much for being a storehouse for nutrients. However, you'll probably get a mixture of um, quality as far as pore size and such like that of biochar mixed in there also. So you know what, you got to clean out your wood stove anyhow, you might as well mix it in with the uh, soils. Uh, is my recommendation. But if you really wanted to go about this where you wanted to know how to be, as farmers often do, the most efficient with the limited amount of resources that you have, then you would look at a specialty burner in order to try to have a controlled burn and make sure that the pore sizes are as uniform as possible. Thanks, Art. We have a couple other questions, but they're really related to soil and nutrient transfer. So if, how about if we have you stop share and uh, stop sharing and then we can get uh, Don and Donna Ray to share and we can kind of move to our next segment here. And then if these you know, questions as we go, if James and Nick, if you don't mind holding your question here, um, we will probably get to those here and, and we'll also have some other time for questions. So Don and Donna Ray, if you wanna go ahead and share your slides, that'd be great. Hi, you guys. It's Don and Donna Ray. And so, Dana, on your question about um, bonfires and saving the char, what you'd want to do is get your fire going quite well. And when you're getting ready to go to bed, douse it down with water and put it all the way out. And when you wake up the next morning, you'll have some beautiful biochar. Not quite as good as the ones in the Contiki or the Oregon kiln or the Tin Man that we'll show you here in a few minutes, but it'll be fantastic stuff. 
quite often we go out on the spit and raid all the fire pits after the tourists leave. And so everybody's going to bring a metal bucket and a broom when they go camping this year and bring home the biochar. Nice. Can you see our slide okay? Yep, it looks perfect. Full size and all, ready to roll. Looks great. Right on. And so if our sound goes in and out, let us know. And we might have to call in on the phone. Our uh, internet is wavering. So what we wanted to do was give you a small farm, market farms perspective on practical composting and biochar and KNF. Um, composting and biochar go hand in hand and so does KNF with that. So um, we'll, we know that Jody covered composting really well and Art just did biochar and we're gonna kind of talk about it from a practical farmer's standpoint. Oh, let's try this. There we go. So this is who we are. It's Don, the Iceman McNamara, I'm a wave sliding fool and I got my sweet wife here, Donna Ray, and we hope to inspire everyone to build some biochar somehow, either in the bonfire or in some sort of a kiln. And yes, we want you to explore KNF. We don't have all the answers, but we're working on it. So we'd like to show you a little bit of how we make biochar and um, compost on the farm here. We have a Johnson Sioux bioreactor. We would especially like you to look that one up on the internet. Dave Johnson does a super job explaining how to build it and why. Um, we'll show you some pictures later on in the program here. And we've just bumped into Korean natural farming about a year ago. And it takes a while to build the indigenous microorganisms in your soil. They're little guys, you can't even see them. But um, that's our source of inspiration. So, yep, you definitely want to be the change. So no one's going to do this for us. We've got to take control of our farming practices and uh, just try and be better people on this earth and feeding the world nutritious, healthy plants. We're grateful for all the people who have come before us and taught us what we know. And so as Jody Anderson and Janice and Ellie and yeah, life is good. So as Art hit on Terra Perda was uh, down in South America and it seemed like they were kind of using it as their uh, trash pits where you saw all the plates and things sticking out of the side of Art's picture there. That was pretty amazing to see the clay pots all broken up and sticking out of the trash bin there. Um, the American Indians were doing a very similar thing to slash and burn, and they were doing it in Africa also. So it's kind of that hundred, hundred monkey rule. Once we learn it, then it travels all around the world. One of the books that's been on my bedside that I haven't gotten to read yet, but I just got recently was is called 1491 New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus, and has a lot of this in um, a historical and readable form. It looks really interesting. So if you're looking for another book before the rush of summer comes along, we are going to be reading that one. The Amazon basin was so amazing. The houses were almost touching each other for 14 miles. And as far as the eye could see, and anybody who's, who's traveled on the river know you can't see very far when you're on the river, but still that was amazing. And so that was when the first white people were looking for the city of gold and they came back five years later and 95% of the people had died from diseases that the people had brought. And so building biochar is super. You're building soil and fertilizer for a thousand years. So um, Groucho Marx would say, what's the future generation ever done for us? Well, this is what we can do for them. And so Dana was talking about building a bonfire. This is 
Richard Perkins in Sweden. So he's at latitude 59 also. Bethel is at latitude 59 and Haynes is at latitude 59. So we got lots of company in this cold Northern climate. The one on the left is Richard Perkins, dug a hole, built a fire in there. The one on the right is our little fire pit at our farm. So it doesn't have to be a hole. You, like Dana was thinking about, we could just do it right on top of the ground. We've done it several times and it works great. Yeah, you just can't get too much oxygen into it. So kind of the hole is a good <clears throat> a good way to do that or some sort of a container that's not gonna allow too much oxygen flow. Yeah, and then you wanna put the fire out when you're done before you go to bed. Otherwise it'll have ashes when you wake up like Art was saying. And so the same size feedstock is always nice. And it so it burns a little more precise but it's not too critical. You're still gonna have some biochar left over. So this like we talked about when the hot dogs and the marshmallows are gone and it's time to go to bed, you just fill it up with water and come to back tomorrow and sweep it up. So this is what we call a tin man, as Art was saying, that's a 55 gallon drum with a 30 gallon drum inside. Um, the one on the left has a insulated chimney and the one on the right just has a single wall chimney. The one on the right, we're cooking our dinner out there at the beach. They had a burn ban going on the Kenai last year. So we had to take our tin man down to the beach and load it up. The tin man has um, a retort burner. So it burns the gases pretty efficiently. So you're not polluting a lot. And the profitability is you're going to get about 20 gallons, 15 gallons of biochar after you have the burn. And you can see on the right, we put our little uh, cast iron pot, pot there and had breakfast on the beach or dinner on the beach while we uh, did our biochar making. So this is another picture from Chargrow. They're in North Carolina. Um, they're on Living Web Farm. So look that YouTube up. They're super. They do so many videos for small scale farmers that it's, it's unbelievable how many knowledgeable people come through their uh, facility. But this was, you can kind of see the 30 gallon drum laying there and the 55 gallon drum. And so that's kind of how it all goes together. The wood goes in the 30 gallon drum with no air holes to speak of, just a couple in the very bottom. And then the 55 gallon drum has air holes in the bottom um, towards the ground. We did two rows of half inch holes about four inches apart. And then at the top, we did one row of half inch holes about an inch down from the very top. <clears throat> so the Tin Man kind of build a fire on top and it heats up the wood inside the inside barrel and the gas is off gas. And so it just turns into a flamethrower. You can just hear it roaring out the bottom holes there when the gas is being burned off. It's really pretty spectacular. Once in a while, the flame will take a woof and they'll blow the top right off. So you have to put the top back on. Mostly I, our top, we kind of lock it on with a ring and but the chimney will blow off every once in a while. So after you get your biochar made, then you can smash it into about oh, quarter inch pieces, half inch pieces. We're not too fussy about it. We use um, pallets for our wood that we're loading into the biochar maker just because it's kiln dried and dry wood works a lot better than wet wood. And you definitely don't wanna use wood chips. There's no airspace in between the wood chips to speak of. And so it doesn't do a real good job. You need some airspace in there. So um, maybe half inch thick lumber at the minimum and twigs are great. So this is our kind of setup there. So we have our tin man there, as you can see by our um, compost piles. And we have a plywood rack that we made with um, two by fours around the edges so we can throw our biochar out there and smash it down. Um, what we found out is if you build your biochar in the tin man and then dump it over when it's finished burning and cool it down quick with water, that expands the holes in the biochar. And so you get a little better product than just letting it cool naturally. When you let it cool naturally, the tar in the wood kind of seals the holes. And so that's probably a good deal to take it apart. We were 
rushing it when we first got here at the farm. And so we do two or three loads a day. They take about three hours a piece. And sometimes I throw it out on the plywood. I melted my buckets and I caught my plywood on fire. And so um, spontaneous combustion is a real thing. So you want to throw it out on your car, on your wood there and then wash it down to get it to cool so you don't so you don't burn yourself or burn your buckets <laughs> or yeah. yeah so this is kind of just our compost if you look on our youtube site you'll see our compost video and this is probably a segment of that one with all the stuff laying out there if you look at that biochar it really um it's very lightweight and it as you take it in your hand it'll sound like glass clinging together it's very very lightweight and open so it's a little different than you normally think of with charcoal and we're looking to hopefully not have those lignans in that art was talking about um, one of the hints that i would also give you is that when we do it this way we'll smash it we'll walk on top of it over on those um, plywood pieces that don has in the picture there um, we also will take if we've been using some wood that was from pallets or other things, we'll sometimes roll a magnet over the top, like a construction um, area magnet, like a, a construction site. And so we'll roll that over and that'll pick up any bits of um, nails or staples or things that might have been in that wood to begin with. It does a great job. So we hit on kiln dried. So yeah, never use pressure treated, avoid paints, be careful with your pallets. So the red and the blue pallets are poison. And then if you look at the pallet safety um, on the internet there, they'll give you, each pallet is supposed to have a sticker on it. So you can see those are from Europe there and the red and the blues are definitely, all, the, all three of those are no-nos. And so the ones in green here, debarked, heat treated, kiln dried, European Pallet Association logo. Those are good ones. and than the other ones, uh, old Europe and colored palettes and methyl bromide, stay away from those. Yeah, so definitely make sure that you and your family and other people that use palettes, you know, it's got, palettes have gotten so popular with DIY garden projects and stuff like that and made little <laughs> strawberry beds and things like that. Well, there's a mark on each one of them. You may not have noticed it in the past and they're not usually as clear as that nice EUR on one on the bottom, but there is a mark on them and it's really important to not um, get those toxins into your system. A lot of those things, the methyl bromide can enter your body through breathing it in. So if you're burning that, you're burning that right into the air and your lungs. So um, let other people know that might be using pallets in different ways that not all pallets are equal. So we found that the glass companies use mostly <clears throat> pallets from the United States and they're built here. So they're not very well marked, which are probably a little safer than <laughs> some of the others. So as you saw from where our setup was, we were right next to the compost pile. You cannot make enough biochar. So we just throw in what we can do and do the best we can. Um, if you just added to your soil beds, it would rob, it, rob the nutrients out of the soil because the biochar, as Art showed you, is just full of pores and it's condominiums for the microorganisms. It holds air in the soil and water. So it just does so much for the soil. Yeah, so give them a chance to move in while they're in your compost pile. That's definitely the way to go. Let it mix all in and then uh, be part of the compost that you spread. And so Richard Perkins in uh, Sweden uh, usually puts his biochar in a trash can and loads it with urine. And so to be safe, you need at least 120 days after you add that to your mix there to have food safety. If you're gonna use urine. And um, then this is our compost sifter. Early days, we use these bread trays that you see on the left-hand side and we have our um, shovel and the compost pile. And then we would just shake that over a regular trash can. A hefty type trash can, if you will. And we still use that for some things um, nowadays, but Don's built this other handy compost and soil sifter. So our friends in Kodiak were looking for a good way to separate their soil. If anybody's been to Kodiak, you know that it's a rock. So they needed some easy way to separate their soil size from their rock size. This seemed like a good way to go. It's got a little vibrating motor on one side. It doesn't really work for the tractor. It gets too heavy, too fast. And so it's an old bed frame with a 
chunk of one inch mesh that we found laying around too. And it just works super with the shovel. I can keep right up with it. It shakes really well. And you can see we have our little trailer underneath it. So you can kind of aim where you're shoveling and it falls in the trailer to about a three quarter inch size piece. And a couple other words about that. You can see that Don used a <clears throat> scaffold, old scaffold that we had uh, to build the sides. And then um, these little springs or yeah, springs, I guess I'd call them, um, hang on the bottom here. Um, in Port Lyons, they did a great one and they just have a hand shaking one that uses bed springs like that too. They did a great job and um, have been sifting their compost down there like that. But it's really handy to be able to either move that little um, trailer underneath it, if you will, or even just shovel out of that into buckets or whatever you're gonna use in your garden. So any of those kinds of methods are good for sifting. And so you can see from the scaffold frame, you don't have to be a carpenter to make it all work. There's pipe straps on some two by fours and some plywood to keep the big stuff from going up to the trailer. You can see it on that right hand picture. The, the bigger stuff falls to the outside and the small stuff goes to the inside. Uh, right now we're using ropes to hold it up. Uh, the, we had bungee cords on there and with the sunlight they failed. And so ropes are gonna be just fine to keep it swinging in yep. the breeze but yeah it's a super way to go reduce reuse recycle repurpose we love that and so if you look at our compost video the that's a face there that you see in the compost pile you can see his big nose and his eyes and his big mouth and so an easy way to look at compost is uh, you have one, two, three on the nitrogen on the right side and then you have one, two, three on the carbon on the left side so one carbon would equal one nitrogen, two carbons would equal two nitrogens. So you kind of go with grass clippings. I think it's food scraps and then grass clippings and then poo and as far as the nitrogens and then it's leaves and paper scraps and sawdust for the carbons. So if you took one poo and one sawdust that would equal out and you could throw that in the mouth of the uh, compost pile <laughs> just as a if you can kind of get that pictured out because 30 to 1 is kind of hard to understand when sawdust is 300 and food scraps are 40 on the nitrogen side so you can check out our video and hopefully we can explain that a little more but um we load up our little uh compost spreader there on the back of the tractor and it slings this stuff into next week. Um, we use it quite often for uh, ground fish off of the spit there. Yeah, so we do a bunch of kind of teaching of um, composting and stuff like that with people. The um, For application, we um, if we have raised beds, for instance, in a high tunnel, um, we'll put one to two inches on raised beds before we actually plant them out or put transplants in um, as a normal practice for most of our veg. And so here's out on the end of the spit there, the fish comes out like oatmeal and we're down there with a the snow shovel and rain gear getting slimed. Yeah, you don't see my picture in there, but I'm in there sliming with him. And uh, it's, it's pretty smelly in there, but it's really great. So when the fish uh, factory is processing their fish, it normally goes down that conveyor belt, all the bad parts of the fish, and they grind it all up right then and there. And then it comes down and in through this pipe and then into this slush box. And the slush box actually has um, a tube that goes underneath and uh, pumps it out to the um, water at the end of the spit or near the end of the spit. And you'll see birds um, attracted to that certain area of the ocean uh, right near the shore. And that's really because all that fish goo is coming out from the um, fish processing that the, the store does, as well as the uh, stations where people are cleaning their own fish from their charter boat or from their boat. And so we just catch it with a snow shovel when it's coming out and um, they're kind enough to give it to us because it's fantastic for the soil. Use what's local for you that works. And so this is how the compost piles are looking right about now. We had a heck of a freeze early in the season as everyone knows. So the tractor just wouldn't spin the compost pile. It got frozen too hard, too fast. 
uh, with this last warm spell, it all thawed out, and then we just got an inch of snow last night, so that's how they're all looking. Um, I should get out there and spin them around a bit. And so to the left-hand side, that is a IMO that we are working on in a farm class we just took, and it's just up to 120 degrees. We were trying to keep it under 120 degrees, and then the one next to it there that trespassers will be composted. It's always good to keep a big flag on your compost thermometer because it's easy to lose it. I can't tell you how many times I've spun the pile with the tractor and said, oh yeah, where is that thing? So they'll turn up in a few days. A piece of flagging tape typed around, tied around the bottom of it is a great thing, but that's, that's a million dollar uh, farmer idea for other farmers. Yeah. It'll save you. And so that's our compost uh, tea maker right there, right there. We used a motor off of a jacuzzi and it didn't last that long. The thing is going 24 seven to, it only makes about 60 gallons at a time. And so it's just running nonstop. We must've run it for six weeks and then it finally gave up. And so we're gonna turn it into a vortex brewer. So we'll have a airline picking up the water and throwing it in the top and it'll make like a circle. So it'll be like a creek running in a circle and circulating the compost teas around. And we do some other kinds of teas like um, uh, comfrey tea or nettles tea, that sort of thing. And we basically are hanging a, a beer straining or a paint strainer bag inside the brewer very often. Yep. And so the nettle tea would be for boron and nitrogen and the Comfrey would be for potassium and phosphorus. So this is pretty fantastic. This is that Johnson Sioux bioreactor. So it's a, uh, if you look at the right there, it's just a wa concrete wire mesh with Tipar inside it on a pallet. And then you have four inch sewer pipes drilled into the pallet. And then you have a frame to hold them on top. So nowhere in the pile is further than one foot against uh, away from outside air. And it really works fantastic. Uh, it's a no turn compost pile. So think how your back is gonna feel with that one. And so uh, four days, two days after you build it, you just pull those tubes right out and it just makes a hole all the way to the bottom. So the air can just flow through. And it takes a year for the fungi to grow inside there. So you don't touch it for a year and the next year you come and pull it apart. And so it's Johnson Sue, Dave Johnson. He did one 10 years ago and it was, he said it's so eerily similar to the one he just did and he used different feedstock. So the microorganisms are breaking things down in the same way, no matter what the feedstock is, which is totally wild. Really great for biologically active compost. Really great if you don't have a tractor or you don't have time or energy um, to turn it. Um, it's a great way to go. Um, if you want to see more about the Johnson Sioux bioreactor or more on our compost making or a little bit of biochar on there too, we have a 45 minute video we did um, on a YouTube channel. We made an Oceanside Farms YouTube channel mostly because we're doing a lot of teaching with Kodiak and had to go remote with some of our teaching rather than be in person. And so it wasn't really designed for us to be YouTubers all the time, but we'll, we'll post some different things here and there. And we do have some good videos also on fruit tree growing. And then just really briefly, I think we should just touch on Korean natural farming and then um, go for questions. Is that cool with you, um, Deshana? Yes, perfect. Yeah, and so uh, Korean natural farming was brought about by no smell pigs. So Dr. Parks was in Thailand and bumped into no smell pigs and he followed Master Cho back to Korea and Metro, Master Cho had been you know, they've been farming in Korea for a thousand years. And so Master Cho kind of looked around at his other fellow farmers and took their recipes and their ideas and kind of put them into a, a book that made somewhat sense. And so we're pretty excited about it, excited enough that we took a seven day intensive course. Just recently, we've gotten back and um, we didn't have all the answers that we wanted to see, but we uh, made all the 
solutions and the solutions that I had made already and we brought them over and the teacher uh, approved them. So we are, we're on the right track for uh, building the better soil and more nutrient uh, food. And so just to give you a basics on that, in terms of basic botany, if you remember back, or maybe you didn't uh, learn some of this in high school or whatnot that um, you may or not may or not have been taught, but um, old biology teachers die hard. So <laughs> I wanna show you a quick, this is the NRCS soil food web. You can look up, uh, they have it in lots of their documentation, but um, plants not only do photosynthesis and feed themselves that way, but they, uh, the important part in our world nowadays that we're really focused on is that they will create exudates that go out through their roots and attract and feed the soil biology so that all those funguses and bacteria and nematodes and so forth will all come closer to the root and they'll protect the root. They'll um, take and eat some of those exudates. They'll poop, they'll eat each other and break down each other. The funguses will break down some of the minerals and to more plant usable or soluble uh, forms that the plant can use and then take those things up better. So the soil biology is really key. Everything's about soil biology now in our world. Um, it's key to making the plant more healthy and then actually make a more nutritious plant and make that plant more resilient. You'll even see pictures when you start looking at some of the studies of some of the nematodes that are healthy for plants to have around them, protecting the roots and the plants being much more resilient to pests and diseases. So if you can um, develop that soil food web um, in your ground all the time, then um, the be all the better. And so you can do that through Korean natural farming. Um, these are some of our teachers that we've mentioned um, a little bit here and there. Living Web Farms YouTubes have been fantastic for us and they have lots of great speakers. Um, so if you're a YouTube watcher or if you're not, you might wanna check them out. We really recommend them. Um, you may have heard of Dr. Elaine Ingham. She's now doing the Soil Food Web School. Dan Kittredge has some really great stuff from the Bionutrient Food Association in New England. And um, he's even doing nutrient meters um, as prototypes right now. And we, and we got to play with his nutrient meter at the farm school that we were at. And so right now they have it set up for about seven or eight vegetables. It's um, pretty new, but if you can point a telescope or a spectrum, let's see, a spectrum, Trometer at Alpha Centauri and tell what Alpha Centauri is made, you can most certainly go to the grocery store and point it at a carrot and tell what the carrot's made of. His problem was he had to figure out what the scale was to be a good carrot and a bad carrot. So it comes up with kind of a nutrition profile based on light waves and so forth. And they're kind of refining that and getting the scale of what's a Costco ca conventional carrot versus a really healthy carrot. And we don't even know what those numbers should be. So he's having people um, send in their results and their carrots, for instance, from around the country to um, kind of create that scale and see what we should be reading. And then hopefully people will make better nutritional choices and maybe it'll even be on your iPhone as an app sometime. That's, that's where he's working towards. So a few rich people have tried to buy his uh, stuff and he's keeping it open source. So uh, the good of the will of the people will be outdo the rich, few rich people. Master Cho is the one who came up with um, or wrote about, um, in a little bit broken English, uh, Korean natural farming. He's now in his 80s and not really able to do the teaching that he was before. Dr. Drake is one of his uh, students in Hawaii, and he's our teacher, really, or has been our teacher, our main teacher about Korean natural farming. Um, you, if you wanted to read some of Jeff Lowenfeld's books, he talks a lot about these kinds of things, as well as Michael Phillips, who's um, into uh, orchards especially, and he just wrote things like Mycorrhizal Planet. Um, Ray Archuleta and um, the moss piglet that he brings up, and that's a little picture of a moss piglet, one of the little tiny creatures in your soil. And if you can, th you can see them in a video, they are so cool. And it, it makes you wanna take care of your soil and realize how much life is out there that we can support and uh, do better things with. She says, cool, but look at the claws on that thing. Oh, he's one of my favorite creatures anyway in the planet. And so when we were at our farm class, we caught microorganisms in rice. It's kind of a detailed um, process, not too bad. It took about six days to catch this many microorganisms out in a 
a bamboo forest. And so it's uh, hard cooked rice in a lao, lao basket. Or a cedar basket like the one you see on our farm with Don in that second picture. Yep. And so since we don't have the weaved basket in the northern climates, we use cedar. Cedar has a understanding with the microbiology. So there's slits in the bottom of the box. And so we took this box out in the spruce forest and the alder bushes and in the birch forest. And we did several catchings of microorganisms. Uh, once you catch them, you have about 15 minutes to uh, preserve them in sugar, uh, brown sugar, uh, about equal weights microorganisms rice to brown sugar. And then they're a little bit stable for a while. And then you throw those in your compost pile and you can grow them again. They're using a protein carbon mix for their IMOs. So, so the, the furry one is IMO1. You add it to the brown sugar, IMO2. And then in the middle right there, that's a bamboo leaves over our pile of IMO3. On the far right, that's IMO3. We used hog food, two bags of hog food and five gallons of uh, water mix that we used. Um, some herbal uh, oriental herbal nutrients and some plant food and some lactobacillus bacteria. So a conglomeration, some seawater and yeah, maybe a couple other things. The recipes are kind of in the book there. So if you have an inclination to start studying this, you could catch up with Pure Drake and he's got a book written. And you can that, call us and we'll, we'll connect you up more or um, support you in whatever ways. That picture on the left, just to say it really clearly also was, um, that basket was buried just like the cedar basket in the second picture. And um, it was just uh, buried so that then, uh, and covered so that other things couldn't get into it. And you leave it covered for those, let's say three days until the bottom gets warm. And what happens is that rice that's inside underneath that fuzz will just be food and the indigenous or local microbes, especially the funguses and bacteria, especially funguses like the white ones you see there, will crawl into that basket. And then um, you basically harvest those and then go through different processes to put them into them or their spores into your compost. Lots of solutions are the other things that feed and enhance the plants and the soil biology. And so there's all sorts of recipes for all sorts of different things. And we're trying to Alaskanize some of those. Yep. And so they're mostly for um, third world countries that don't have a lot of money. So your main ingredient is vinegar. And as all of us know, we can make vinegar out of just about anything. So they do brown rice vinegar and next would be banana vinegar and next would be apple cider vinegar. And we've made the latter two, but we haven't made brown rice because brown rice really doesn't grow here. But uh, getting the calcium out of the eggshells is really fun. It's the uh, premature lava lamp. So the eggshells just start bubbling in there, going up and down. And it's really pr pretty fun to see the, the bones of, ma of mammals, I guess. No fish bones. Well, fish bones would work, but no bird bones. And they just start bubbling away. Um, so even though we're not a third world country at this point, um, we are um, in danger of our supply chains going down and things like that. And we also want to use natural things, including the natural microbes in the area. Um, and so if you're using mostly things like vinegars and sugars and local things, um, you can build these wonderful concoctions um, and grow these microorganisms and support your plants, which is the main thing to do, um, and hopefully put Monsanto out of business or bear. And so Donna Ray was talking about the exudates earlier. The top one there, fermented plant juice. You take uh, plants early in the morning while the dew is still on them and pick just the very tops. That's where the auxins are and add those to one third to one half weight brown sugar. And the water will just pour out of those things and you'll make a juice out of it. Um, so you're short circuiting the system, the exudates, you're taking them out of the plant and then you'll be able to feed those right back into the plant again. So they're plant soluble nutrients that are ready to go. It's totally amazing. You can spray them on the leaves and put them into the ground. 
Yeah, it's wicked cool. Those of you who do a lot of um, crop rotation, we're kind of thinking that if we really create the soil biology um, and use these supports for the plant that we can easily make from local things, um, that we won't need to do as much um, uh, crop, crop rotation. rotation. Yep. So if you had a problem, then you would crop rotate. And if you didn't, then you might be able to just with the plant exudates that we're gathering in the fermented plant juice, we're really turning a monoculture into a perma or a permaculture, not permaculture, but polyculture. Yeah, big words. Okay, Deshana. Questions? We've yes, yet to thank you. you. Yes. No, that's great. Thank you for sharing your slides. I did share the, uh, there was a request and I shared the videos for your YouTube along with the YouTube produced by Cooperative Extension with uh, Don and Heidi. Lovely. And yeah, so we have those resources. I also shared some information, uh, publications as a follow-up to last week on compost in general, the basics uh, for some folks. Um, let's see, we have, what is the name and location of the farm school that you attended? Was that just, was that the Drake? Was there a name? It's a uh, KNF farm, or if you look up pure, pure KNF. KNF. Dot org. Yep. And he has a Sunday YouTube podcast that he does for question and answer period. So it's pretty nice that you can just get him on the YouTube. He'll answer you right there. It's live. YouTube live. Imagine that. YouTube live. Going back to a couple of questions earlier that were kind of as a crossover for both of your sessions. Um, there was that question, we can go back and look at those now real quick on, at what soil depths do you think new nutrient charged biochar would be most useful in Alaskan soils? That was a question from earlier. We have a thought on that? At what soil depths do you think nutrient charged biochar would be most useful in Alaskan soils? Well, I see, so all the life is in the top six inches. So I would say you don't want to till deeper than two inches or you're going to be messing up the life that's down there. So let's say, yeah, let's say the top four inches because we, we don't want to till too much as we've been learning in the last few years. Did that gotcha. help? Yeah. And so yeah. You, definitely, yeah. you definitely want to charge your biocharge biochar in your compost or compost tea urine uh we what met kind one, of urine by the way i was going to ask uh, let's see i would say you and me but we met one farmer in hawaii that was on a uh, urine therapy Whoa. we're not <laughs> recommending that yeah that was, sounds kind yeah. of intense i don't know do we want yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's stuck in my craw yeah not our thing yeah what is the best method I, for you? Or oh, go ahead, Art. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say uh, one of the uses now biochar I mentioned in my presentation uh, is in animal feed, and especially with cows, one of the advantages that's seen is that it helps the digestion of the cows, uh, but also then uh, when the cows create cow pies, um, you already have the uh, biochar mixed in. Uh, to the manure. And so there's kind of a practice now uh, for not just that end of things that is loading the biochar through the cow, but just as far as the health of the cow of uh, feeding it to them. But some see that as a double advantage. Interesting. Cool. What is the best, me best method of using, wait, what is the best, best, best method of using as soil amendment for raised bed gardens? So some thoughts on biochar and raised bed gardens. Best method, is there a better approach for raised beds? Yeah, and so if you look at the Living Web Farm biochar YouTubes, the char group guys are doing some studies and they're really finding a lot that like two pounds of biochar per acre when it's low, fully loaded and they're just putting it, putting it right at the seeds because that's where the magic happens where the plant is feeding the soil and the biochar is holding all the nutrients that the plant needs and wildlife that the plant needs. How do you know when the biochar is fully loaded? One interesting thing that we saw with the 
uh, when the biochar is fully loaded, I would say, boy, 24 hours. It doesn't take much for it to soak up the nutrients and the things like that. In the compost pile, you're going to want to wait until the compost is done because it happens a little slower in the compost pile. But so I would say if you were in a rush, you would do some compost tea. You could do fish, anything that adds some nutrients to the compost. But what I was going to say is the no smell pigs was totally awesome. We were in Hawaii. It's 75, 85 and no flies and no smell and three pigs and they're in like 16 by 12 cages. Each one has their own cage. And it was totally amazing. You would think that that would be a stinky place, but it's like hugel culture underneath the pig. So they dig down four feet, throw some logs in there that are big enough that the pig can't roll over as they're digging. And then uh, wood shavings. And then the pig takes care of the rest. He starts pooing and it turns into soil really pretty fast. And they add, um, Korean natural farming solutions to that to help it all break down and feed the microbes. Wow, cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. Have you experimented with, I'm gonna say it wrong, Bokashi composting at all? No. B-O-K-A-S-H-I. Yeah, maybe they can explain it a little bit if they're. Yeah, or James, art. did you? Art. For art. I'm not familiar with that style. James, yeah, did you sorry. want to unmute and uh, give us a little bit more detail on that? The Bokashi, if I'm saying that right? I think we covered that. Where is James? Um, in the meantime, uh, even tap roots for fruit trees and shrubs can go too deep. I tricked mine with soy-based blue board. So some folks are making comments in here about things they do. I don't know if you can see the chat there, Don. Go lateral instead of down. Do you take soil samples for analysis to note how much nutrients are available from using compost slash biochar? So how do you know? Do you take soil samples for the analysis? Yep, and so we just do the compost as a maintenance about one inch, about five gallon, five five gallon buckets per 25 foot row is our method of operation. And that's per turnover of crop. So if we do a lettuce crop and then turn it over, we do another compost and another lettuce crop. So we're growing soil pretty fast. We probably build 30 or 40 tons of compost a year. And we do have Brookside do a compost analysis of our uh, compost pile specifically. Um, and hopefully we're building more and more microbes um, throughout the farm and they'll take less and less IMOs in the future uh, because they'll be established as a, um, as a biome. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to say Pike there uh, with the fruit trees, if you haven't looked at Michael Phillips um, and his orchard stuff, it's pretty great. And he's been into the microbes too. Um, we, uh, when we were at Drake's farm there in Hawaii, we actually, took his um, tractor and put auger holes in and um, drilled those for existing uh, fruit trees, if you will, um, out from the base of the tree. And then we filled them with fish and um, fish amino acids and some IMOs so that those roots would actually extend out more laterally and it would help feed the tree. And you know, the KNF way is not to put all of your nutrients right underneath the ball of the fruit tree, but to try and get them to grow out. Yeah, and so kind of what we're learning is to put your fruit tree in a little more shallow than we've been taught in the past and spread the roots out kind of like a spider web over a pyramid and get those roots up in the top four to six inches to help them stay up there where all the nutrients are and stay where it's a little bit warmer in the summertime. Nice. I don't see any other questions specifically. Um, the gentleman asked about the Bokashi doesn't have a microphone. So, oh, here, Bokashi is an anaerobic composting method. That's a little bit extra, a little extra about that question. Did they just asking if you've attempted any of those 
It might be because uh, Don's <laughs> wife is a little afraid of those anaerobic bacteria that you can get that we haven't explored stuff like that so much because yeah, you can get in trouble with some of the anaerobes as we understand. That would be a, a, maybe a good Jody question as well. Yeah, or Janice. Or Janice Chumley, yeah. yeah. Let's see. Um, yeah. I think when we took the master gardener class back in 2010 or 11, they did talk about throwing some yard scraps into a trash bag and letting it compost that way. And it'll happen pretty fast. Yeah, gotcha. So I don't see any yeah. other questions. Oh, go ahead, Art, did you have some? I was just gonna ask. Oh, I was just gonna thoughts. say, uh, I believe that Darren Schneider, who's the Ag Ward agent uh, out of uh, Juneau, uh might be proficient in that style he'd be someone to ask oh. well does anyone have any other questions we could uh, have folks come off mic and ask verbal question i don't see anything else in the chat good conversation excellent presentations thank you both any last questions at all we have a few more minutes any other things to add art or don and donna ray Yes, everyone's saying thank you for the information. It was very informative. Lots of resources there, videos posted, a um, couple of links for some publications. Um, everyone who registered will receive the recording of tonight's presentation. So of course, those who aren't here will get the recording, but they'll see it in their email box. But if you uh, wanted to review some of the things talked about today or this evening, you'll get the recording in your email box tomorrow as well. Any other thoughts? Okay. Well, thank you all so much for attending this evening. Um, we will be also, in addition to the email, sending a evaluation. We'd appreciate your feedback on the session this evening. And um, please fill that out as well and send that back to us. And um, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Terry, for joining again tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, Art, Don, and Donna Ray. Have Thanks. a good evening, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Stay safe. Good night. You too.